material sourcing can provide enough parallel manufacturing so that anyone, anywhere, can say, we have this community, this community is going to produce all of the material for the people within it, and if we want more, the machine can produce the excess capacity needed to make sure that every need is actually met. Then, of course, you say, oh, well, now we have this self-reproducing machine, what do we do with it? We take this machine, we give it to anyone that wants it, literally anyone that wants it. How do you guarantee there's no conflict over materials? You don't create a differential in access to materials. You say, I have this machine, I make a copy, you have this machine, we both have a machine, I have my machine, you have your machine. If you're an asshole, all right, fine, you can go be an asshole, it's not my problem. However, I have my machine and I'm in control of this. Personally, I, I think the model of setting it up in old Walmarts, old big factories, something uh, we did the math out, 35,000 square foot, or 135,000 square foot Walmart, your standard Walmart throughout the U.S., will have roughly the amount of uh, uh, throughput capacity with these sort of technocopia machines that you could have 5,000 people living comfortably, maybe 9,000 people living a fairly Spartan existence. Um, this is sort of uh, game-changing, because now we say, all right, what used to be uh, 158 hectares of land for most people's uh, footprint can be reduced down to about three and a half square meters of high density indoor farming. So, high density, uh, uh, so let, let's do a run through of what this machine looks like. On one side, you have high density aquaponics farms built on the principle where uh, closed nutrient cycle, everything that you uh, are producing is either recycled back through the system, uh, through the compost cycle, or through uh, the water nutrition cycle, and uh, anything that is your primary bulk input is something that the plant is going to be capturing out of the air. Let's let the plants do the hard work. They figured it out. Let's be perfectly honest, we're not as good as they are. So, they are an input. They produce, obviously, primary food, fish, plants. Okay, you got your food input. Now you can say the surplus from that plant production goes into your materials processor. Plastics made out of cornstarch, carbon fibers. You burn down any uh, biomass and you get your carbon fibers, you get your graphene. Uh, you also get from your fiber inputs, your clothing, your wood boards, your structural materials that you can build. Uh, housing and uh, when you start really analyzing it down, there's a large subset of things you can do, and there's also a restricted subset that you can't do. Things that are very, very high temperature and high pressure internal combustion engines probably won't make a lot of sense, but neither would the fuel for them either. So, this opens up a whole new way of thinking about politics. So, if you can literally take the economic picture, uh, the economic equation out of the politics entirely, the economics and the, the, the way in which people gain access to their material needs is separated from what is traditionally thought of as politics. Politics is being sort of a great battle. Uh, Politics is traditionally thought of as something uh, that is human rights. And, and I think that's a, a perfectly reasonable place to put the flag of where politics uh, lands. Things that are individuals taking from other individuals their ability to have freedom and uh, access to material resources, but also the freedom to exist in the world. So any time that's your, your very clean boundary. For those of you who are familiar with Isaiah Berlin, the negative liberty boundary. So anything on the positive liberty side, yeah, you just sort of generally want to get rid of that anyway. And on the negative liberty side, simply enforcing that no individual can take liberty from another. So the material access to resources from an abundance machine means that ultimately any individual can be free in a very real and material sense. So all of the uh, excess time, the, the, the great question comes if nobody has to work because the machine produces everything, what do you do? Uh, obviously the question is, what would you do when you retire? What, did you what would you do if you had a million dollars? What would you do if money was no object? That's what you do. I would do science, I would do engineering, others would do art, others would do uh, spend more time with their family, their kids, their uh, parents, their grandparents. The things that people actually want to do, your life. What do you do? You do your life. That's what you do. So, from the political standpoint, and specifically from the American heritage, we have an example of this. We have a very good example of this, actually. Uh, or, depending on how you look at it, a very bad example of this. Uh, the Jeffersonian farm example. Um, Jefferson's model, uh, from, you know, the, the, all the way to the back, the platform of the Whigs, 
their platform was every individual uh, uh, farmer has their own level of production. They produce all of their own needs and a surplus that they sell at market for, you know, other things. So, unfortunately for anyone who knows their history, the only reason that it actually worked was because it sort of included, quiet, hush, hush, a, a group of slaves that worked for you. Well, here's, in the modern context, that's obviously not only unacceptable, but unnecessary. We have robotics and automation. That is uh, essentially the production system. So, now you can say, okay, well, there were a, a, a lot of really important arguments and important compromises that we made from that model moving forward into the industrial era that we can now walk our way back from. We need the industrial era, era to get to where we are, where people can be independent, but once you got past that, you need to start having uh, a new conversation on what is our social contract. Because clearly the, the, the old social contract that we had is broken. You work hard, for their, your labor is always in demand, well, we can just stop right there. That's not true. Your labor is not in demand. You don't have a saleable asset anymore. We enter into the free market without an asset to sell. And although some people enter into the free market with more than enough assets. Some people are born into rich families, some people are not. And it used to be you could work your way out because your self, your assets were saleable. Not true anymore. It's not the world we live in. And it is accelerating away from it. We are not going back to full employment. We're not going back to an employment economy at all. It's, it's just from a robotics, and especially from an industrial robotics side of things, I can tell you in no uncertain terms, it is not coming back. Not for us, not for anyone else. It's already happening. It, ha it started happening in the 90s. Well, you're a lot Well, you're competing in the workplace for, well, so here's the thing. If what you're saying was true, that, that we all work, well, you don't actually work for what you're worth. That's the really important point to, to notice, is that your purchasing power in the United States, well, we're just going to talk about the U.S. example, your purchasing power has steadily stagnated from 1978 until 2008 and has declined. The first time in all of history of the United States has begun to decline since 2008 and has all the way down. We didn't see the beginning of this because we had outsourcing to deal with. Outsourcing with a whole confounding variable that was happening more or less at the same time as automation. And it happened in this sort of, uh, we reacted to the outsourcing when really we should have been reacting to the automation and saying push through, all the way through. There's, uh, uh, if you stop halfway, you have just oligarchs owning all the robots and we become, you know, uh, we like to call ourselves a service economy. We're a servant economy. We serve. The question is, who do you serve? You know, think about that. Really, think about that. Who do you serve? So, coming back to the idea of abundance, you say, that's what this looks like all the way through the end. Makerspaces are the short-term example of this. So Makerspace is where you go and you have community access to the means of production. If you choose to see it that way, you can make fucking plastic toys and bullshit all day long if you want, or you can make a new life. Or you can make your own automation framework from which you gain power in the existing free market economy, or as free as it is. So, if you say that the only thing out there is everything should be sold, everything has a price, everything, 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 everything in the free market, well, the end result of that is one rich guy with all the robots and us, you know, massaging his feet in turn. That, that doesn't seem like a free anything, you know. So, the better way to look at it is to say these abundance machines, the, the subset of things that can be abundant, can be produced abundantly, that is sort of this bounding bubble of an abundance machine and anything that can be produced within it. So here's where it gets really interesting. Now you have this abundance machine producing not only its own uh, internal components, but all the things that people all over the internet uh, come up with, but now people all over the internet can come up with ma new machines, new manufacturing capacity as produced by the existing machine as it's already there. So the machine makes additions. You get specialization in different areas. Some people will want to have something that makes circuit boards. Some people will be less interested in that. You can differentiate as necessary, but the core reproducibility element 
that can that can go everywhere. And once in place, it is the local communities and the local people that get to decide what gets produced, and how much gets produced, and what to do with that surplus production. The local people get to decide that, as opposed to having some external entity, whether it is the, you know the Politburo, the free market, whatever you want to call it, the uh, someone setting prices for you that you will pay. You know. No matter how you look at it, the, the market's just another group of people telling you what your stuff is worth. You know, and I don't see much difference between that and the poll bureau, to be perfectly honest. So, once back into the hands of people actually making those decisions for themselves, and a shortened supply chain so that literally your supply chain extends no further than the place where you go to get the things that you want. That's the, the beginning and end of your supply chain something gets screwed up, you want excess capacity, this is not something that has global repercussions. Oh, the global stock market crashed. So? So what? You know? It doesn't matter. It's unaffected. Thinking of production as the core, it's the very first thing. Everything, government, freedom, whatever politics you want comes after materials. You have nothing if you, have, if you do not have material independence. And most people don't. Our entire economy is built on not having material independence. Uh, you know, I, as I walked in, I heard someone mentioning artificial scarcity. Well, obviously there needs to be artificial scarcity because some things are scarce, and how do you price them in an equivalent system so that the scarce things are dealt with in the same way as the non-scarce things? Well, you have to create artificial scarcities in order to equate those two, in order to trade them. So, all of these complex and convoluted rules that we've come up with don't make a whole lot of sense if you realize what is actually possible and what sort of production we could actually begin doing. The makerspaces, to their credit, are gathering together the resources, are gathering together the machines, but none of them have any of the politics behind it, or at least most of them don't have the politics behind it of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Why are we making, why, are, why is production important? So many of our, our uh, political discussions fail to take into account where things are produced, who makes those decisions, who makes the decisions on how to distribute those resources. These things are ignored far too often, and I think now is the time to have that conversation, because abundance is in fact possible. We can, from now, with current gen technology, it's not like I need to invent anything new, it's just an engineering problem from here on out. We can have abundance. So. The question is, are we going to do it? And if so, what's the next step? For me, it's getting involved in a makerspace. Finding your makerspace and then talking with people, making sure that they understand there's a there's an end goal here. This this isn't just, you know, playtime. I mean playtime, sure, fun, some people, but there is an end goal. We can escape we exit the market economy permanently, peacefully, and under our own control. So, you know, we are the makers. Uh, we want to make the world a better place for having been. So, one thing while you're talking, like, I can see that abundance and machines that make machines and all that, mm. but there's only one problem, maybe you could speak to it, is like, uh, you know, energy, like gas, the electricity grid, Batteries don't work that well. Batteries do. So here, so primarily, energy from solar, stored in batteries. There are two different technologies that are carbon-based, uh, both of which are available right now. Uh, carbon battery, which is uh, directly, uh, rather the dual carbon electrode battery, which technically is a capacitor, not a battery, but semantics, it's a battery, it fits into a battery-sized thing. Uh, this device can store as much energy as a lithium ion and is made of carbon. So, so there's your mobile battery. For your grid scale storage, quinone flow batteries. It's uh, <laughs> this awesome little molecule that you get out of rhubarb, uh, that you distill out of the rhubarb, and you put it into this basically just liquid flow tanks, and uh, it's sort of like a closed circuit um, uh, fuel cell, where uh, you can either recharge it back into the, into the fluid, or you can dump the whole fluid and, and in one go. Uh, mostly for grid scale, you, that would make more sense to have just big, big storage tanks. Uh, what's cool about the, uh, the quinone flow batteries is that you can independently uh, uh, produce your how much capacity, so the, the actual size of the electrode, how much energy you need to push in and out, 
and how much storage can be totally different things. Your storage is the size of your storage tank. So, uh, you know, a city could have uh, a giant electro grid and an even larger uh, tank, but let's say the population go, uh, goes up, they just simply resize the electro and the storage tanks don't have to change, or vice versa. And that's for solar. And this is for storing solar. Uh, you could also do wind, you could also do uh, solar. Thermal actually has a uh, right now more promise than um, photovoltaics because the, com the, the carbon based photovoltaics are very low at, uh, low efficiency but you can make literally carbon pure carbon graphene based with little carbon nanotubes sticking out of it solar panels that have nothing but carbon can you, can you speak to um, the part of the machine I know we're you still you've got to get engineer but the part of the machine that takes the nutrients and mm. uh, converts those to the materials that we need to yeah, the materials digester. I, I wish I had my laptop working. Uh, unfortunately, whatever. Uh, the downside of using Google is you need the internet, right? Uh, so the uh, uh, the materials digester would be well. There's probably not uh, schematically. It's one digester. It's really probably a collection of digesters. Uh, the first one that we're actually working on producing right now uh, is one that takes starch from any various source, uh, any, uh, uh, not cellulosic yet, but we're getting there. Uh, right now it's just uh, either cornstarch or, or you know, sugar or whatever as your input. Uh, you process it with uh, lactobacillic bacteria, you get lactic acid, you polymerize that and you get polylactic acid, which is the corn plastic uh, that you use for 3D printing. So that's your first path. Uh, the next path would be uh, simply taking that plastic plus uh, the, uh, to be perfect now, hemp fiber would be the best, like, you know, Massachusetts laws. Yeah, look, the hemp fiber is fucking fantastic. Hemp everything is fantastic, you know, from, uh, from recreational, as most people, to, you know, the industrial. The industrial side is actually way, way more valuable and important, so uh, hemp fibers and uh, the oil that comes off of uh, hemp is fantastic, uh, just hydrocarbon inputs. And so um, the, the construction board that we're looking at is uh, PLA as your resin. Uh, plus uh, a large proportion of sawdust or, or uh, similar type fiber. Then you have construction boards. Now we can start making the structures of the machines. They're all based on uh, uh, layered MDF at the, or, uh, sorry, uh, layered plywood at this point, uh, strand board, that sort of thing. Um, that's how uh, all of the machines are currently produced. But then uh, now we start saying, okay, we have this hardcore resin. Let's take a look at cracking the, uh, the molecules. And it's essentially, once you have cracked hydrocarbons, you have anything that came from the petroleum industry. So any petrol chemical that, that's out there is also available because literally it is already uh, a bioavailable uh, material. That's where it was sourced from in the first place. So uh, now we start saying, okay, now we can do the high-end resin uh, for carbon fiber. Uh, the fibers themselves uh, and all the graphene that can come from any of those biomass inputs, purified enough to, so that they're just hydrocarbons and then uh, pyrolyze so that you get this essentially carbon black. And carbon black is your graphene, your carbon nanotube, raw material input, um, you know, and purified CO2 uh, from burning off the, uh, the biomass gets you your pure chemical input that you need to make uh, different types of carbon nanotube inputs. Basically, each uh, material needs its own digester, and then there is a subset of digital automation machines CNC and uh, 3D printers are sort of schematically how it works, but there's a whole collection of them that work in that way. Uh, if you actually go look at industry and how they produce things in industry, it's just chaining together these known and very simple modules. Except all the modules are stupidly expensive and, and there's, there's no reason for it. So one of the, the things our, you know, my first company did was build a open source, dirt, dirt cheap, industrial controller. We installed it in industrial places we did, you know, neurosurgery, like, so right now we, uh, we're in the middle of a uh, clinical trial validating. So the idea is, okay, now this exists. This is an open source controller. Now everyone can do industrial automation at industrial grade uh, production levels that, that I can guarantee succeed, I can guarantee this, I can guarantee that, because now it's available. And this open source thing, only one person had to do it, and everyone has it. Everyone here now can go make a little industrial manufacturing unit if you were so inclined. Uh, uh, 
my uh, uh, for-profit side is a worker cooperative named Neuron Robotics, and then uh, we have a not-for-profit 501c3, which is our makerspace. Uh, that's where we house the machines and do all of our core development. We operate it like a, an incubator, so people, uh, either people or businesses come in, they use our machines, they produce whatever they're going to produce, and then they sell it back into the market to pay for the membership. Uh, it's worked reasonably well so far. We haven't been around for a year, but we also haven't had a month where we uh, didn't make rent. So, you know, woo! Small victories. Again? Say it. Could you repeat the name again? Neuron, Neuron. Robotics. So that's the uh, robotics controller. Oh, yeah. I got cards for anyone. Oh, okay. Hi. Thank you. Will center your hacker, please? Uh, Technocopia. Uh, it's a portmanteau of technology and cornucopia. The technology of robotics. Literary. No, okay, fine. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm kind of a technical question. Sure. That's less interesting than I was watching. I'm game for both. All right. All right, I'll ask both. Uh, the, so, technical question first. Mm. Do you really think that given today's technology, you know, no new technology being invented, you could fit? Uh, all the means of production on the entire world, you know, it's like a size of a Walmart, is that what I thought I heard earlier? Uh, it's much smaller than that, it's about 22,000 square feet. Um, and not the production as it currently exists. Yeah. It is a new yeah. kind well, of production. actually produce what we still get out of it. Yes. I just find that it's literally impossible. Yeah. Any single product that's being produced today, you can make it a Walmart? Not every product. Yeah. Every, every product within the subset yeah. that is carbon-based. Yes. So uh, the, the primary input of the ultra-high density farming uh, uh, my favorite example is, is one that doesn't use any technology at all, uh, the, the aquaponic system from Willie Allen out in Milwaukee. So in three and a half acres of urban land, he's in the middle of the, of the city, like city blocks on all sides, three and a half acres, he's producing a million pounds of food on just sunlight. So, so that's like, that's the starting point. We take that and we add to it uh, a, a series of research papers that NASA did in the 90s when they were planning to go to Mars, which is uh, high-density lighting production, so uh, producing L uh, very specific narrowband spectrum LED lights. And you go out uh, into the market and you look at the LED lights that are there. If they list the spectrum, which most of them don't, they're off by 20% and in the wrong bands and missing four of the important bands. Every single one of those lights is garbage. Garbage, garbage, garbage. And they cook off more energy than they should. A plant is actually, or a series of plants on the ground are going to pull down about 9.09 9 .09 watts per square meter. So it's one meter, they're only absorbing about 9 nine ish watts of power. That's way, way less than uh, what uh, the, the high density sodium lights are actually kicking out and way, way less than uh, even the LED lights. They're like 120 watts, and they're not even rated for a full square meter. It's like a you know, three quarters of a meter circle. So when you start saying, OK, let's know really seriously engineer the lights here, the, the LEDs. Let's go back to Philips. Let's find the bin codes that get us the band we need. We can produce 9.5 square meters on 20 watts. And that suddenly means that if you have one, uh, one and a half square meter solar panel, so a little bit bigger, uh, will produce about 200 watts. Now suddenly you say, oh wait a fucking second, we can stack like nine of these up underneath one solar panel? This is the density, uh, the density improvements that you can get from actually looking at the engineering specifications of farming and industry as if they are the same thing. They say, okay, no, seriously, look, we have the numbers, we have the math, Let's look at this as a complete system as opposed to, oh, I'm just going to do, you know, LED farming because that's like the one narrow slice and I'm going to sell it to the market. Oh, all right, you're missing the bigger picture if you don't look at the whole system and how those things are produced. Because yes, LEDs are going to be way more expensive than they would necessarily be able to produce if you're buying the LEDs and not printing them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was my technical question. Uh, sure. John, to ask another of my political question. Unless someone else wants to go uh, in between? Yeah, go for it. All right. Um, so it kind of there's the saying, 
widely attributed to Bossy, but was not just Evan, what goods don't cross borders uh, are useful. And I think it's it's true, is that trade and uh, you know the market is kind of when you're buying eggs for someone mm. once a week, you're not going to murder them. And this is kind of how human societies work out. So if we reach a point where we don't have to trade with each other anymore, you know, does that worry you a little bit about kind of this great force for peace, which is kind of bring you to business with each other? It sounds like a sign cut of trades for Christ's sake. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that's it doesn't make sense when it comes down to, uh, uh, it makes sense if you think that uh, money is everything and that resources are, are the only thing that humanity is, is doing. That, that us interacting with each other is like only a resource thing. And really it comes down to resources are, are shitty relationships where we're like angry at each other and then everything else is like a different kind of relationship. It's a social relationship. So uh, when, you know, we interact not as I'm trying to sell you something, you're trying to sell me something, which is that impersonal market reaction. We're talking as people, right? You know, I'm, I'm here talking as people. These are different kinds of reactions. So, and there are different types of relationships. There is no one mono relationship the, a category that everyone at all times will always fall into. You know, it's a, uh, we are a product of our s surroundings. And I can see that phrase being true in a time when there is literally material scarcity everywhere, especially across borders. But it's really the aesthetic scarcity still of saying, you know, uh, there's only going to be one holy shrine, and if two religions are arguing over it, you know, uh, how are there going to be wars, all these other things? Couldn't material scarcity actually be a way people can reconcile their differences? You know, on other things that are ultimately irreconcilable, just to do business. Religious with each other. wars are a wild card, and a, and a oh. different set of arguments, of course. You know, uh, religion is, is sort of the the rejection of observable reality. So you can't like say there's the, there's some like factual thing that they're gonna uh, hash it out over, like that somehow trading is is gonna re result in the religious uh, differences being settled. Yeah. I, I don't I don't. Buy it. I think that the, the religious problems between any group of people is going to need to be settled between those group of people one way or the other. It has to be settled between them, and no proxy is ever going to settle it for them, uh, trade or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Wacky ideas? Who thinks I'm wrong? Who thinks I'm totally wrong? A little bit wrong? You have a website we can look, uh, look like you have your progress, yeah. your uh, Technicopia.org. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll put a link on the front page for all that, that heads to, well, that heads to uh, Neuronobotics. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then uh, Neuronobotics is the company site. I, I wouldn't say you're wrong. I'm just trying to actually think how to bootstrap that system. And to sure. me, you have the self-replication, I think, is a big <laughs> part of it, right? That's that, uh, literally the end goal. So. Uh, you would have to have, and you're talking about solar panels uh, yeah. using carbon, you'd have to have like nanobots that could produce a solar panel at such efficiency that it could power themselves and enough to make another solar panel. That kind of this sort of bootstrapping. Ignore, well, it of ignores that the, the the existence of the real world. We we live in a world where we don't have to literally bootstrap it all from internals. Uh, that we can take advantage of the existing industrial infrastructure to get there. You know, we can make our, uh, we can use microchip processors or Intel processors in the meantime because there's a fucking infinite of them. You know, the solar panel. Uh, let's be perfectly honest. You know, the long run, uh, if we can really crank up production on silicon solar panels, that might win out over the carbon ones and we just produce them and ship them out for free. But it's the sort but of it's thing where it's centralized. Well, it it's it can be de it can be decentralized and also the the production of the. Uh, the processors and the silicon solar panels will come at the same time. So that would be one of those machines where, yes, we can do the carbon one if we really have to be pure about it, like going to Mars, for example. There's, you know, different material properties on Mars, and that's something that you're going to have to uh, contend with. However, in the meantime, uh, using the silicon solar panels as a vitamin, as an, uh, you know, from the point of view of the system, it's a thought experiment about how many vitamins can we eliminate until we get to uh, uh, relative abundance and then the self-replicability <laughs> of the abundance means that another copy is free. And that's really the, the goal, is that another copy is free. Whether or not it's produced in, in a factory or, or produced internally and uh, you know redistributed along with everything else is a decision that can be made sort of on the fly as you go. 
Uh, you can also utilize regular uh, electricity infrastructures wherever that makes sense. You got a good thorium reactor? Great, use that. You know, fuck that. <laughs> I mean, seriously, what, what are you fucking around with solar panels for if you got that? Uh, uh, but that's not available everywhere, so you don't say that's the core. The idea of describing the core as fully self-replicable is to say that schematically, in our mind, we can become comfortable with the idea of, no, seriously, this is actually abundant. You know, uh, it's about getting to that mindset, because the mindset is what really needs to sort of shift. Non-consumerism, non-consumption-based societies have to start thinking in terms of materials are abundant and should be abundant, should be everyone should have access to their needs. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the nuances of when you take over from using a vitamin to uh, internal production is uh, a subtlety that can be developed along the way, but it's not something that you sort of have to like be super, you know, staunch, rigid about. It. Like, fuck, you know that? Like, no, 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 that, that's silly. You you use what makes sense to use to get to this sort of end goal of abundance. That that that's the abstract end goal, not strict and rigid, but as a thought experiment, attempting to push it out as a uh, disadvantageous element. This is not helping us, and we're trying to eliminate it as sort of a general rule, that, that you think in terms of this not being ideal, as opposed to saying this is absolutely restricted. Does that make sense? Right, like solar is more than adequate in terms of its efficiency today. Sure. Power, you're talking about. I mean, just in that one scenario, one solar panel can, can power nine levels of, of agriculture. And you're talking about one and a half square meters of, mm -hmm. of growing area times nine. So that's, it's like 12 square meters of, of growing surface Not for with, one, with one square meter of, of solar panel. So, I mean, the technology is there. I mean, one solar panel can produce enough energy over its life to produce three more solar panels. Mm. So clearly it's it, it, it's there. Then would it be better if we had better technologies? Well, sure. What, it costs one barrel, uh, one barrel of oil to get 90 barrels of oil, so that's the ratio for oil. So one to three solar, one to 90. To, I was just comparing. That was the number back in the 60s. That's oh, not really? true anymore. It's oh, what one is to it now? Three. For barrels of oil? Yeah, it's one to three. Uh, Why do you think all the oil companies are sort of freaking out right now and going We're not deep running oil. out of sunlight, but we're running out of oil. Is <laughs> that low now? I'm Why the hell are we going? Tar sands? What do you think tar sands is? 2.1. Yeah, there's another issue with the, with the fossils we talked about. And that's you're taking a resource that was buried and taken out of circulation. I mean, right, back in the carbonaceous period. Millions of years ago, depending on, on which perspective you subscribe to. Um, the bottom line is it's out of circulation in the atmosphere. So now you're releasing the, that, that carbon back into the environment and all whatever other chemicals are inherent in that lockup. Back when that stuff was all being captured, we had millipedes the size of alligators and dragonflies the size of eagles. Like, so the Earth was a different place. In that way, is another, you know, that's another question to ask myself. Yeah. So which way do we want to change the planet? Do we want to bring that type of atmosphere back into existence, or we're a different type? Justin, have you heard about the, the so-called magnetic motors? Or I really like to think of it as magnetic battery, because it's not really... The thing is... Yeah, 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 that's really cute. That it's, they've, they've the energy up. sucks, but the, the energy density sucks. I mean, it's, it's well, well below... Uh, uh, you know, coal, like, <laughs> it's well below, there's no examples, there's no example of an energy storage technology that, that is that far below, uh, you know, something that's useful, like a battery or capacitor. Uh, cool, it's a cool mechanism, and maybe we'll come up with some uh, nifty way to do it, but that idea of storing the magnetic field at the time of producing, I know exactly what you're talking about. So, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, it's this really neat little trick where if you create permanent magnets, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, stupid amount of energy to create a permanent magnet. Uh, and what it does is it's this little machine that sort of uh, essentially in a continuous pattern demagnetizes the magnets over time. Uh, um, so it runs like a motor and it looks like a motor going, but it's, you know, oh man, the order, orders of magnitude more energy to, uh, to actually store that into the, the magnet structure than it is than you're ever actually get back at. There, it's a goofy little table toy and it's one of those like, you know, Industrial or uh, you know executive office desk toys, but but I, I, I wouldn't take that too terribly seriously if, if, once you work the numbers out. Yeah, I just heard stories of being people finding ways to make it more efficient. So I wasn't sure if you heard. I would love to hear more uh, uh, about when that finally comes out. I keep my ear to the ground. That and you know the other sort of crazy unproven technologies like the yeah. cat. You know the there's some cool stuff uh, that are. Uh, 
unverified. Um, and you know, as a scientist and an engineer, I really um, when I present you know, ideas, I present the ones that are, are you know, peer-reviewed papers, uh, stuff that actually has verification in the, the scientific community. I think that needs to be researched. I think there, there's probably some more efficiencies that, that can be gained there. I think there's really something interesting. Yeah, because this is a different mechanism for electric motors, uh, or non-electric motors, as it were. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I just find that's one of those things that, for some reason, it's particularly hard to find someone who's willing to research it, which always catches my attention on those things. And, it's because when you do the back of the envelope calculation, you know, uh, uh, talk to someone who's actually made magnets before. Um, the the actual energy that goes into the the needing magnets that they're consuming as part of the the process is just it's there. That's not an efficient process. You know, you're, you as an energy storage technique that is garbage bad. Um, you know. Because on the same, uh, in the same mindset, you know, we could be putting our time into things that already are up to spec with lithium ions. You know, the uh, the current dual carbon batteries coming out of Japan have uh, right now they have a, a lithium electrolyte, but it's not com chemically converted, which is sort of an important distinction for anyone who's into battery tech. Um, it's a, a charge transfer, and we can get a, a, a capacitor that charges in 16 seconds that that has the same energy density as your standard cell phone battery. I mean, for Christ's sake, made out of carbon, you know, and it's got lithium, but it doesn't. The reason lithium-ion batteries are difficult to mine is because not because of the lithium; it's the cobalt. The cobalt in them is, is stupid expensive and very rare. So, um, the uh, the fact that this technology is carbon-carbon and some lithium ions, of which we have in the United States, giant, giant mountain of it. We found it out in Colorado. Montana. Anyone actually know where that? In Oregon, it's in the water. As it, or it's <laughs> that's not great, actually. That, that's pretty bad. Um, uh, yeah, we found this giant ma mine of lithium out in one of the big square states. I don't remember which one. <laughs> what? I'm from New England. I'm sorry. I can't. <laughs> you pretend like I'm not. Yes? Uh, can you stick around some? I know I a little Yeah, I know. Oh, right. Sorry. We got to try to uh, get. Well, we'll never get back on track. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Uh, Herd and cats, right? Uh, are you going to stay with us at the Elk Expo or uh, camp with us? Yeah, well, I'm going to be. I'll be around for uh, the the afternoon. I don't uh, uh, sort of have camping stuff. Uh, we gotta, so I'll be uh, I'll be around for a while. If uh, if someone wants to talk about uh, technology or the politics that that it implies, I'm I'm very interested in having conversations about both.